And first order business is public comment. I think we have, I don't know what we talk about, first block. Do um, you have any desire about how you want to? Well, we've just prepared like a group statement that okay. I'm just going to read. So to read in, the, in an effort to streamline. Great. That is perfect. Um, and you can sit down and work in. Okay. It doesn't matter about the microphone. I think there's a microphone. Ah, futuristic microphone. Um, my name is Emma Bay Hansen, and I have two kids in the district, and um, I'm here to testify on behalf of Alternative Education Programs, Earthwalk in particular. Um, a larger group of Earthwalk parents are here, and we met um, prior to this meeting, and in an effort to streamline our public comments on this issue, I will be uh, representing them and summarize our collective thoughts and questions, and I'm just going to read. Um, we are here to open up a dialogue about how we treat absences that occur because of enrollment in educational programs outside of the school building, such as Earthwalk and the Nature Center. We see, um, we see tonight as just the beginning of a larger discussion, and thank you for making room for this on the agenda. In years past, days spent attending Earthwalk Village School were considered excused by the district. This year, days spent attending Earthwalk will be recorded as unexcused. Our sense is that this change is perhaps the product of a fresh interpretation of the rules by our new administrative team and does not represent a shift in the long-time support for the program by our school community. Our children's absences have prompted truancy notifications for many of us, which brought our attention to this matter. We feel strongly that participation in Earthwalk or other such valued educational programs should not be treated the same as a child skipping school for no apparent reason. We have always felt supported by the teachers, administrators, and community for our decision to provide a flexible solution to our children's educational needs. We hope to find a way back to that supportive environment in a way that balances with the needs of the district. We are concerned that treating participation in Earthwalk as an unexcused absence may have unintended consequences. Parents could decide not to participate because of these truancy letters, and this could make it harder for these programs to exist and to continue to serve the many children that love and value the program. We hope that you will explore the following questions on tonight's agenda. One, how would Earthwalk garner the designation of quote unquote approved education program under the current law? Two, how do other schools and districts um, treat attendance to Earthwalk and other such programs? And can we build on those models and our past policy to be more supportive of programs such as Earthwalk? And three, what can we as parents do to help move towards a solution? Thanks again for your consideration. I'm happy to I have copies of this if you want me to give those to you. If you have copies, yes. Okay. requirements of the law um, supports the education of the kids uh, that, that are involved in the, in the school and the, and the program simultaneously. Um, and uh, thanks. Great. Okay. All right. Just walk to your supportive and to answer any questions and help build a strong relationship with the school and with what we're doing out in the woods. Mm 
Anyone else for public comment? Uh, so next we're on the consent agenda. Uh, and um, I'm actually going to request one of the people because I think we need to have some little discussion about this for a couple tasks about some policy changes. I think we probably need some follow ups on. Um, which, since Bridget's not here, we can appoint her committee to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, another thing I just, before we do, I, I do want to uh, acknowledge all the great work uh, from the students to Mike McCray, uh, to the policy committee, to the rest of the board um, for uh, putting together the, the first, uh, first equity and community policy. Uh, I think it was the product of a lot of, you know, fantastic, uh, fantastic work uh, and it's a real nice next step to uh, some of the work like by the Black Lives Matter flag. It's the great work again. It's just, it's just, it, it puts something a little more concrete and gives us some guidance to work right for it. So I really want to thank, thank everyone for it um, and uh, we're very excited to be looking forward to you know, implement this policy and uh, you know, work to better achieve those values. I wanted to say thank you before I entertain the motion for uh, approval with that one. Uh, she like I pull, I had a question about the agendas and warnings. Yep. If we could pull that quick from the consent agenda. Sorry. Yeah, we can pull that too. Where is that? It's the last I move that we approve the consent agenda <coughs> minus the policy monitoring report and the declaration of public position. Second that. All those in favor? Aye. Any of those? Great, thanks. And then um, let's go with the. Uh, I just think super quick. The list is great, but it doesn't include any of the school websites. And I thought it should definitely include all the websites with everything should be up, and it already is, but. Oh, just to put sure it on there? Yeah. So just play on that password mode. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We also yeah. got a request from Tina to post it at the Senior Center to add that to the board. That's a good idea. We can certainly add that. I think that's, and that's our colleagues at the city post there. There's, we have a, there's a bulletin board there in the city posts, or it's posted the agenda for the city council. Mm -hmm. Do you think we can email it to Dan and he can oh, post it? But not Dan, he doesn't work there anymore, so oh. you can email it to Dan. Yeah. If you get that information ahead of should we do it. So should we prove the declaration of posting with those two additions, the, the school websites and the same time? Is that other? Mm -hmm. Is that OK? Uh, so I just have a quick question about that. I think I've talked about this before, but when we were called upon in the past to demonstrate that we had posted in a certain location on a certain day, we were not able to document that because although it had been posted there, it had subsequently been and filed. And so when the people posted, like, um, Amy at City Hall or Janet at the Senior Center or whatever, but basically they stamp it um, so that we're able to document that it's actually posted on the day that it's supposed to be posted. So do, is the place where it's posted responsible for keeping the record? It's a little tricky. But it, well, but you just have to, yeah, exactly, but you have to think through, like, if, right, I mean, yeah. if we have to show that we posted in a certain place on a certain date, we have to have systems in place so that we can show that. Would that just be if somebody was there on that date that wasn't there, no. we were in violation? Let me, let me. I think it's in, speaking in retrospect, but it may not have been. Well, if we can't show that it was there. It's barely an issue. No, one, right. no one's going to see how to see what our agenda is. Does Heather send it by email to those places? 
Yeah. Well, technically, there's, we have to have what, two physical locations, and then the websites were required by open meeting law as opposed to, right? And that's all. So we everything else on top of that is essentially a good gesture on our behalf. That's the, yeah, as far as like, I mean, this list is great, but I don't think we're bound by law. Unless putting it on that list well, uh, should we um, we might want to get clarity on that from a lawyer. Uh, we certainly need it by closing all the schools, but that's the same. And then the rest of the people wouldn't necessarily have to look around. Because yeah. yeah. we do not want a situation where, you know, if you have to be told, you can go to the senior center. Um, there's more, you know, faulty. Can we send it to people not on the list? And then they have to go on the list. It is mostly distribution. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much all this is. If you have to go to the you know, we could just change the headings on the list that these are the pre posting locations and then everybody else is people we have to do as well. I don't know if simple as that, just change the headings on the list. But it's and then, so the list is going to be postings do already date it. When do we afford the project? Yeah, I would just put it where we need and then just say, as a courtesy, we'll make reasonable efforts. Yeah. Should we approve with that chain? Or do we want to read this? Wait and see what it looks like. Okay. And then the others that I pulled out the fiscal management report because I think we should. Um, there's simple policy changes. Um, but we should get the process in place to change those policies. Which a couple of terms or I was surprised I actually didn't go back and find her and look at yeah. They are. I don't know how we missed that or where we were in the process when we got to that last year. Last March we got to it. How we missed some of those policies. Is that something we can pass the policy to just to make those changes? We have a big goal. Make sure that everything is aligned with the new policy line. No, I have a big goal. Good, otherwise, we can do this. I just wanted to make sure that that happens. Motion to approve the fiscal management report. So moved. Second. Uh, I also wanted to, before we proceed further, uh, do a cut and paste submission. Uh, this section for Hope and Emma it was not put on the agenda, but yes, but um, we do plan to hear you and want to hear from you. So sorry for the omission. I just wanted to make that clear. And, uh, Do I have a motion to uh, 
appoint these as clerks. I'll make a motion to appoint Mr. Frost as board clerk. Second. Second. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now on to uh, the discussion items. Um, and thanks, Evan, thanks everyone for coming. Um, we do want to talk about the first walk and also some attendance that we have around extended vacation. Um, I sent around the both our policy and the law. Um, I just want to, I want to say one, like I hear you on the volume first walk, I've heard great things about it. I know the program a lot of students have benefited from. Um, and a lot of students have, have really, you know, have, have found, at least for, you know, the time that's come for that, uh, a good rhythm to have when to experience. But obviously, you know, as a district, we want to promote outside education um, and look for opportunities to do that. Um, what, you know, we understand there has been a change from what had been happening in the past. Um, I want to make clear that we have never had a policy regarding how we treat outside, you know, outside of the life of the um, So what was occurring in the past was, should have technically been occurring to our existing defense policy and Vermont State Law. Um, we have a, a counter policy. Um, we also, at least not to my knowledge, have not had any sort of formal arrangement with Earthwalk about how, um, you know, how we would handle students who want to go to the floor. Um, including not just the attendance thing, but, you know, other questions that I think should come up around that, such as, you know, who's responsible for ensuring that the class time is made up? Is that a teacher responsibility? Is that a parent responsibility? Um, what do you do if it's not working for kids? What, if, what do you do for those kids where maybe that time out of the classroom um, is creating, you know, they need math, I think. They need reading class. Um, questions about equity. Um, you know, right now it's it's de facto available to the families that can afford uh, to send their kids to Earthwalk, both from a financial position, but also from you know, getting them there, transportation logistics. Uh, not all families in the district are in a position to do that. Um, so there's this kind of you know fairness and equity issues around Earthwalk. And other questions, you know. Why just Earthwalk? Um, Earthwalk is great and it does great programming, um, but it's, it's outdoor education, which might not be a fit for every kid. Um, you know, what about parents who might want to do something in an arts program, in a music program? So I think there's a lot of, of unanswered questions about what the burden would be on the district. Um, you know that that we haven't wrestled with, and then there's you know. The, you know, the legal questions too. You know, the state law requires that students oh. be in class for, in attendance for 175 days a year. And then that, you know, the public school qualifies, there's approved education programs, and um, there's approved homeschooling programs. Uh, excused absences are pretty, pretty clearly defined by the law. It's basically emergency, and I haven't dealt with see what emergency means, but I'm guessing it's, it's sickness or it's family emergency, and then out of town for 10 consecutive days or fewer. Um, and then there's the ability to excuse, you know, for instance, our district goes 178 days. So those three extra days can be excused because all that's required are the ones that we bought. So the superintendent can excuse uh, those three extra days. Um, and that's it. Chair, does Earth walk out of town? Uh, yes. Uh, so if Earth walks out of town, so it could be excused if, it's, if the superintendent directs. Mm -hmm. Absence from town. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get some case, case law on that, but I'm pretty sure there's no case law on that. And I think that as long as the idea here is to prevent truancy. Yes. That's the whole point. So if kids running around town, you don't want that, right? So if the parents take the child out of town for Disneyland or for Earthwalk, I believe it's excused under the law if our superintendent allows it. Under policy, we, we 
we can delegate that to the superintendent. I know the, the North Branch would not qualify. It's in town. I mean, it, How would we decide which the programs were allowed and which programs weren't? We don't have to. It's out of town. Do you qualify Disneyland versus something else? I don't have an understanding of Disneyland. Out of town. It's one of the like, things that's allowed. My wife took my, my daughters to Costa Rica last week. Last, a couple, a few weeks ago. Absolutely excused. Ten days. No, less than. Less than. Less than ten. I'm just throwing it out there as a. Hmm. I don't really have a. There are many valid points. What you're saying. I'm just saying. I don't think there's any law against what we're making. I think it's a policy that we should have the district about how we want to treat that, and that is something we can do. We don't have to excuse these, but I don't think we have to not excuse. I, I don't think we should get clarity on, yeah. on what absence from town means. Uh, I think we can get some legislative intent language and some, some case law, and I've asked for those, so we can get those at some um, Now, it's, it's a valid question because it would give us some wiggle room. But, I mean, I was reading absence from town as being family vacation. Yeah, not. But that's yeah, not what it says. Not like we weren't able to see because. Montpelier residents wouldn't be able to participate in the North Branch Nature Center. Uh, technically, a Roxbury child could go to the North Branch Nature Center. And, and the law gives us that discretion. Yeah. Well, there's a question like which town? Is it the town the child resides in or is it the town the district? Because we always don't have any other towns in San Francisco. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. We, we can. It doesn't excuse that we need to create. A substandards ourselves by which you know yes. we delegated that to the superintendent, right? So we just need to be really clear. That's all. You know, it doesn't mean that we would say, "Oh, well, I guess we our hands are tied. We have to excuse our block." Right? They're not saying that. Well, and also the board obviously would never ask the superintendent to break or even bend the law. The law. And so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why we like uh, clarity from Pietro about. Right. And so know. it, it may be quite some time before parents who are participating in these programs um, stop receiving truancy letters. That may just be part of the routine. That's how it works. And I think we also need to discuss what the impacts of the truancy letter are. I mean, my understanding is, and I know it's not a fun thing to get, but it is a way for a mon for monitoring of basically any sort of educational deficit that may be occurring due to that absence to occur that we would have to create in the absence of that. So, so my saying is basically, and I would not like to get a transfer letter in the mail. Um, but what happens then is, is AOE and but my saying is that AOE basically will check in with the district DCF. Sorry. Uh, and say, is this creating an educational problem? Is, is the child falling behind? Are they suffering? Are there other issues that are accruing from these absences? If the district says, no, the child's doing great, the child's thriving, that's basically the end of the inquiry. Um, and if there is an issue, then there is the means to take corrective action. Yeah, if we counted these as excuse absences, I think we'd want, as a policy matter, some sort of internal monitoring to take place anyways to make sure that you know it, it was working both for the child um, and then for the classroom too. Because you know, as teachers, if you have you know you you know teachers teach cohorts, um, and if you know there's holes in that cohort on a consistent basis, you know and you know, a teacher knows that, wow, well, on Friday I've, I've got four kids who aren't there, and I've got learning that's kind of dependent on, you know, the whole class participation, you know, that's a burden on the teacher. So I think we have to be mindful of... But do we do that for family vacations? But do, do all families regularly take vacations every Friday? No, but if, you, but if you take one for a week or two weeks or three weeks off and on throughout the year, I mean, it's the same as I mean, it's the same issue. And I'm not so sure. Having some sort of a check-in, I mean, I know a union, there always has been that. The teacher would check the principal, everybody would agree, no, this, you know, these kids are, this kid's up to speed, they're good to go, go. Yeah. And, you know? But mostly kids do not go on vacation outside of the vacation. 
They do all the time. They do all the time. They just don't go for big blocks. They go here, there, they go. Sometimes they do, and I think the question is
we could expect agreements really quickly. <laughs> and, I, and I think those are necessarily yeah. connected. And I think there's a substantive difference too between um, a one-time trip that maybe it could be for a variety of reasons. It could be, you know, this is the only time that, that works to go to Europe. And regular absences where the main purpose is to supplement education. That to me goes to a tacit endorsement of that as an alternative education that the district is sanctioning and giving a certain subset of families sanctioned access to it. That's a hard one to pin down if you're splitting hairs and I think you've got to be really clear about it. I mean, I'm, I'm advocating for making it unexcused if you go on a family vacation when you should be in school. I'm okay with that. I'm not trying to create a, you know, a, a choice here that nobody wants. I'm trying to create, I'm trying to be consistent. Um, I get, I, I agree there's a class issue here, 100%. I also agree that schools should not, teachers should not be required to bend over backwards to fill that back in, right? That's just, that's unnecessary. School exists for a reason. You're, you're enrolled in a public, public school, public yes. school, right? So there's rules for being a public school. If you can't make it because of, you know, then you're an excuse. So can I follow up on that with the rules for being in public school? I'm not very well versed in homeschool law, but if I decided to pull my kids out of public school tomorrow and homeschool, I would still have access to some of the resources within the district. I could bring my kids in for art class or gym class. Is that correct, Libby? Yeah, so they can do in sports. You have to right. file with the agency of education to get an approved homeschool programming, right. um, and then you could you could access certain pieces of our day. Right. But you are not considered uh, part of this school. You're not in the right place. all the numbers. And right. But it almost seems like that for some families is that they, you can choose whatever alternative education you want, take advantage of some public education resources. But yeah, so it's not you can't even get into the actual academic classes though. You could take advantage of up to, I believe, four core content. So it's within the core content areas. Um, but it's not um, I'd have to really look at it. Mike, do you know off the top of your head? I'm sorry that I got distracted from this riveting discussion. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's home school. How many courses? Isn't there, you can take advantage of four core content areas? Am I right on and that? And still be considered homeschool? Yeah. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. There's some limit to what it used to be. It used to, you used to have to have six to be considered uh, full-time to qualify to play in extracurriculars. But I think that that number is gone by the wayside a little too in the last few years with flexible pathways people not um it's keyed in on that number that's in our handbook i know right because i have addressed that before that there's a certain limit to kids there's a certain opportunity kids can access and there's a certain limit they can access um, so if you're homeschooled you could advance chemistry class here right so it seems like there might be for some families a solution there by defining yourself as a high school student Maybe to conclude, I am concerned. I don't want to add extra burden to our teachers, and I do have concerns that with people popping in and popping out, if it really is going to throw, even though it might not be necessarily an extra workload, but just the daily management of the classrooms, I don't feel good about having kids constantly shuffling around. Well, so people have been doing it for years, though, and so the teachers must have been accommodating this. I mean, do we make can do we have data of any kind? Um, how many kids have done that? Done yeah. in these programs? Yeah. No. However, there's a, I think there becomes, so the procedure, like I said before, I didn't change the procedure. Um, it was, the procedure is so pretty cool. clear right. in our handbook as to what the district would consider a excuse versus an excuse absence. And it didn't say other outside activity. Um, so you didn't change the procedure, you just started following the procedure. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, to be clear. Yes. Um, and so the, um, was I going with that? So before, um, I'm, I'm aware that it was just, uh, so here's the difference. If the board says to me, change your procedure mm -hmm. and add that piece to it, that adds, a, as Jim is saying, a different level that gets contractual with, with the teachers to say, you, we're allowing this, and you will make up the, like, I can't tell them to just skip the work. 
you know, just skip the learning. That's unethical. Um, so we're essentially telling the teacher, teachers that it's okay for the child to not come to the 175 days of school work that's allowable, and you need to make up the extra time with the, with the kids somewhere. So in high school, kids miss classes all the time, and they make it up, and that's expected. But in elementary school, it's different. And in high school, we're really encouraging a lot more flexible pathways, alternative programming, kids doing their own thing. But in elementary school, I don't think that, I think people hear that the district and the state, in fact, are doing flexible pathways, but I don't know that that applies in the same way at the elementary level. And middle school is even harder in some ways than either. Right. Because their students are their taught to be responsible for themselves immediately upon fifth grade, right? They, they sort of a like shift to, oh, you've got to make it up. Right. You know, it's really hard in middle school. And that's why I think a lot of them drop off immediately. But the, I think the difference with the, the high school is that the flexible pathways, the, the structure in place yeah, the super, to supervise and monitor. And somebody's watching, supposedly. Who lar largely yeah. individual students are responsible for making up work that they missed. But it's, missed but it's, it's within a, it's well, within a it's month month month. right, by the district, each, each, well, each kind Well, of, I'm thinking less of, so flexible pathways yeah. is approved, yeah. but if kids miss classes for other reasons. But I, one of my daughters, which is a senior, she has missed a gazillion classes. And she's a real pro at making it up. She's on my list. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, for a wide variety of reasons, she has missed many classes. And it is on her to make it up, not on them. But, but it does take some time of the teachers to tell her what she missed or whatever. But that's a very different scenario from elementary oh, school. And there's also time built within the high school day where right. teachers are available okay. to ensure there's no middle block at elementary oh, yeah. Yes, yes, the policies are for the whole district, not specific to each school. Right. But this this alternative programming that we're talking about is even specific to the That's actually the general too is for a full day. So right, that's the interesting thing. If you're if you haven't received yeah. a choice of letter, never. And maybe your daughter has missed as much of classes that you had all together yeah. as uniform. No, me. I think in practice they've always been on the excuse of middle school, and I think it's really the elementary school where this may be a kind of a change of practice. Change of um, or a following of the procedure that was created. Yeah, the same procedure. The, the, same, the same procedures in place in each of the schools. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying in place of this is. They were not practiced by the procedures not to practice. I think it's the only way to school. I think that's the only time. Because I've talked to the Pam in the past, it's been like, no, it's unfortunate time to school. I can't imagine the Pam would say anything other than that. Which provides a different question as well. Or all of our schools should be following. We have the same procedure. All of our schools should be following the procedure and understand the procedure. Unless there's a reason not to. Unless we change the procedure. Well, I think you know. I think Michelle said it very well, which is that there's a different, you know, the way that we teach each school is very different. There's kind of, you know, making something up in second grade is almost nonsensical to us, but in, in high school it makes a lot of sense, right? And so we have this. You know, I'm just saying it's very different. So, as a former second grade teacher, I would say it's not. Yeah, it's not so. <laughs> <laughs> you, miss, you miss a day in second grade, you might really miss something. <laughs> you have children in third grade on IEPs, missing a couple of days in second makes a big difference. Um, I just I want to raise an answer that I to do again after the last time. We actually do this for We do have some families that have been posted that are have gone out of time for sort of consecutive days. Um, requesting the expectation that you know, can the teacher give us you know, four weeks of work that we can do, um, which is obviously a big burden on the teacher and I think very unrealistic. Fair one. 
Um, which again is kind of related to, to this. Yeah, you know, it seems pretty clear what we've got for what that is. It's exotic to, uh, there would be a large number of these days. Um, but I think try to, you know, should be have a discussion about parameters around that. My, my instinct is that we're going to have kind of a long period of time. There's also an issue to deal with that gap. Um, what is it right now for absences? I'm talking about parents saying, I'm going to have a two-month vacation. Yeah. Um, We're talking more like two-month days. Uh -oh. Yeah. Well, but even two weeks. <laughs> if, do I get, after the 10 days, do I get um, a letter that says,
happens regularly. It has to be taken out of school to do so because it's supervised by DCF. Um, not necessarily educational, um, but yet beneficial to a kiddo. Huge. Um, and quite honestly, I'm not sure how we treat those visits right now because I, I don't know, just kind of hit me on the head, you know. So, so that. But it gets, to, I think it's a, it's another indicator that it's a slippery slope quickly. Um, and so how I would need help from this body of how do I define that and how do I ask my principals to define that. Um, you do it now as, what's the policy, what's your Within our procedure. That, Which that is what? These are the, these are the excuse, these are what count as excuse okay. absences. Um, and anything other than that is an unexcused. So, um, I mean, the DCF act, the DCF idea, I'd have to ask my principals exactly how they look at that, so I don't know. Um, and how, how many unexcused absences can they take for every year that you went to the other ten? So it's the same for every more than ten days vacation, more than ten days, but about the same thing. Do we need um, a policy or procedure for what happens if the scenario you were just giving me, if I say I'm going to take my child out of school for a month and I'm going to ask the teacher to provide work and and catch them up after they get back. We don't we don't really have a policy or procedure about that, but I'm not sure I'd want to ask the faculty to do that. What I have said has come up from labor relations and what I've said to the teachers during that time. Do the best you can, and that's all you can. Um, and no, you don't need to stay after school. You can need to stay to school to 3:30 because that's what your contract says. <laughs> um, and from that point on, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't actually say anything about Seattle or anything like that. Uh, is it in the? It's the state law. It's the yeah. It's, it's so. It's not state law. It, so at 10. Um, absences, that's when the truancy letters. Oh, I'm sorry, I was, I'm DCF sorry. and the news, the new Washington County judge, the mm -hmm. truancy judge, is actually just brought I just went to a meeting on this two weeks ago, three weeks ago, with all superintendents of Washington County. Yeah. Um, DCF wants, and the judge wants all 10 day absence that whoever hits that mark, all of those letters and copy goes to DCF. Um, and it's exactly the process that Jim. It's a piece of paper that says, you know, it's just a kid here. You know, have you, what have you tried? What have, you, what have the parents said? Which is great. And then at the bottom it says, what? Yeah. Have you had, is this kid falling behind? No? Okay. Like it's not going to go anywhere. It's just a paperwork job. I meant, but I meant the, uh, you would talk about the DCF report mandated or supervised absences. Uh -huh. Where they're going to another parent. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. That you said, well, we'll just follow the procedure. Not necessarily on that one, but they're, they don't see those procedures. I see they, that the, the board gives you the authority to, to make the make decision. The procedures, those are in the handbooks. That's what I'm wondering. The handbook yeah. copy. What, what is listed in the handbook as allowed and not allowed as an excuse? I didn't get to the exact language. Okay. So, me. Yeah. We have, well, we have the policy. We have the yeah. Which is, I think, the handle. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want that right here? Yeah, you don't, you don't want me out on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, back to Michelle. Yeah. 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 I mean, back to Michelle's question of what's our action here. It's just, you know, we either make a decision that we want to, you know, kind of guide the superintendent or we just be quiet. Just let it sit. Yeah. Uh, I would be interested in hearing from other school districts like Burlington, where there's Cozy I think is a similar program. Brattleboro area, there's Vermont Wilderness School. You know, how, what do they do if, if they um, have policies and procedures that still fall within the law, but have flexibility or or not, if they just send out to the other Do you have like a VSA? Does VSA have a district? A wide? I can get a wide. Um, the answer to that, I, I have talked to Luis and talked to Dante about that. Um, yeah, he said exactly what we said. Sometimes she's absent. This is what happens. If you get your mind, nothing happens. Um, and that's, that's their policy. That's how they follow their policy as well. Um, 
I mean, Excuse is a good way to have that check you're talking about, where no, after no, 10, no, no. someone outside the district, or the district must review it effectively at that point, because you're going to go before the transit judge, so you better be no, ready to no, no. not before, well, but you're going to submit no. something, right, at 10. And the Jersey judge is not going to hold anything unless it's potentially educational neglect. But I guess what it does for you is it, it makes you think, oh, we're at 10 now. We're sending a letter to the truancy judge. How are we doing? Is this kid really OK? Or yes. not? It, it is a trigger for us right. to so make sure. To the sense, the more of those unexcused you accumulate, the better, rather than a whole bunch of excuse. Right? Yeah, well, that's right. if you do them all as because excused. Because if they're excused, you're not keeping track of anything. Right, yeah, that's exactly. And that's, that's kind of what I'm saying. I think the truancy letter is not pleasant to receive, but it's an automatic check that I think we have to put in place. I mean, and we have to put in place asking all these questions about equity and fairness and which program. And, what, and I actually, I, I like your idea of you know, an excuse for Disneyland. So. I mean, it is, an, it is a move towards equity, is what it is. <laughs> no one's going to it, Disneyland. No, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still going to put my kids when I get to Disneyland. But, yeah. but then, at 10, and then at 10 of those, someone's like, you know, this really isn't good for this kid that this family keeps pulling on us. They're not really succeeding, you know, or it's disruptive, or it's creating too much pressure on the teacher, or, you know, there's like all of a sudden there's something to be trapped. So, I got no problem with that excuse. According to, so go back to our handbook, according to the handbook, um, and I have the high schools, I can pull up UES, but it's the same language, so that's the mom. Um, excuse absence is only granted for illness, family emergencies, religious observances, and medical appointments that cannot be scheduled after school hours. So no out of town? That's not one? No. So, so that's, but look, this is a permission for the district to do it if they want to. That's different than what we're doing. We don't have to follow this. It's going to be more restrictive than the law. The law is saying, if you want to excuse out of town, you can. And we're saying, no, we don't excuse them. So what happens, what, what do we do now? So we just decide. Well, it depends on how many days you have. Well, it does. It will. I, do you want me to talk about it? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, um. You probably have fewer students going to Disneyland. And you're following the handbook, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, Good. yes. So, I, students come to me constantly. Sometimes I feel like the only purpose I serve is to sign their planned absence. <laughs> <laughs> but at least I'm signing sometimes. Um, and I always check unexcused when students are going to Thailand or whatever. Um, because they're, they're going on vacation, so it's unexcused. And we accommodate them because we want to, you know? I mean, if a student is gonna be gone for an extended period of time, which is why this is coming up, that's, that's different to me. If you're gonna be gone for a month or two months, then we gotta slow down and say, wait a second, like, is this reasonable to put on us? But if a student is going to be gone for a couple of days, then you know we say check in with your teacher, see what you're going to miss. You're, you're responsible for the work that you miss. You're going to make it up. And uh, but it's a, it's unexcused. The question then is is it going to trigger a, a truancy letter? And the answer is that uh, technically yes. And there are so many absences, which is a plea that I make in my opening letter to families each year. Please, please come Stop to school. Please come to school. <laughs> please plan your vacations carefully um, so that it's not, I, I think there's like an element of respect about um, the challenge that that poses for, for teachers in schools when people are just gone all the time. And you're trying to hold a class and half the kids are there because people are out doing good things, but they're, they're not there. Um, so, yes, we, we I, I, I ask that of families in the summer letter, please come to school. And when people have good reasons for not being there, we, we do our best to work with them and accommodate them. And I do think it's different at the high school. Uh, there are students that are constantly engaged in really good stuff um, that takes them out of school and uh, they're older and they're in a different developmental level and so they are navigating the executive functioning skills necessary to plan ahead and to and to make up things and I think that that is, is good for them in, in some ways um, but 
when the piles of unexcused absences come in um, for this or that, uh, there is an editing process, right? To say like, does it make sense to uh, go to truancy court for this family or, or not, right? Like, is, is, there, is there a concern that we have? You talked about the trigger. And I'm sorry, but I'm not concerned, um, you know? And they're, you know, if they have, great, they have good grades, I mean, it's not just like, oh, we like them. It's like they're doing fine in school. But if they're not and we are concerned, then it is a piece of the puzzle to try and to support a family. So, I mean, I think there's an element of practicality that, that does come up for us um, with truancy. And the other thing that, I mean, I, I think is worth saying, and maybe you know this, and I feel like you kicked it around a little bit, but truancy for schools a lot of times is very much a dead end. It's a ton of work with almost nothing on the other side. Um, so. What do you mean by that? It, 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 it means that uh, oftentimes it's not taken up by any community partners, so particularly at the secondary level. I mean, you know, that's where most of my experience is. And so if you have a 16 or 17 year old that's not coming to school, you file truancy thinking that you're handing the baton to DCF or uh, restorative practices, or Washington County Mental Health. The baton is not quickly or easily taken. Right. That's low on the scale. It's very low on the scale. Um, and in fact, sometimes they, they're just, uh, we're not. So then, as a school, we have to make a decision about how much energy are we going to invest in pursuing that path, or are we going to put our energy into re-engaging the student? So, I mean, I know that that's not quite the discussion of, about missing a day of, of school uh, in second grade, but but I can't tell you my dad's daughters have yeah. some unexcused absences. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> can, can I make a radical suggestion? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I actually suggest that we kind of trust the main administration's judgment on this and kind of let them continue forward. I, I think the one request I would make, make is just making sure that families that want to do this, that there's really good communication with those families about what currency means, what the process is, uh, that this, you know, is not a, you know, it, it's not a discouragement or an encouragement of it. Um, it's simply a check and that, you know, we can, you know, if they're going to Disney World, we likely have all the other details the same. Um, so families know what they're prepared for and when those letters come, it's not a scary thing and they know that as long as their kids can be fine, it's, it's just a, you know, a piece of mail. Um, how does that sound to folks? Totally support it, but I have one thing. I yes. don't think that what, what Mike is doing is being done everywhere. And I think that's probably the right way to do it, which is to just call them an excuse, even if they're going to time or whatever. Um, I think that I just looked at power schools for middle school mm -hmm. to see what happened with my daughter. And I, I can't quite read power schools, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure that it says that she's excused. And so, you know, we planned ahead, we did everything else, you know, so probably it was considered like, no, this isn't going to this kid. But I think that probably should be unexcused under the way you have the hand, it's in the handbook that way. You listed them, and going away on a family vacation is not one of those things that's excused, am I right? Steve, I think her sister was unexcused. <laughs> Actually, there's a, there's a third option that teachers can pull down, and it's called planned absence. And I don't know how that one gets recorded. I think that's up to five days. That's under the 10 consecutive days. That can be approved by a principal. So, but in policy, it doesn't say that being out of town for any amount of time can be excused, right? Yeah, it does. It has that with prior knowledge, the principal can approve five days. Okay. Then yeah. I honestly think that that's not accurate. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not classified. Well, it's like well, there's, there's as much discretion for emergencies as there is for other towns. No, I mean in policy, in our or whatever, but not, not in the law. I just want, I just think it should be tight. I, I really don't think there's any difference between going to Disneyland, Thailand, Costa Rica, or Earthwater. Or, or, or I don't think there's any difference. And I mean, especially when we're talking about the scale that some of us do. And I, I just, just think about it. I mean, I think that that idea of tightening it up so that we're clear that we're supposed to be in school. We have a calendar. 
that are already on that list. So question number one, if you could. That's the agency of education? Yeah. Okay. yeah. That okay. Or the part would have to go to the agency of education and, and do that. Um, not sure about number two, although we have one example from the Um I think I'm my question is actually about the agenda because I, I apologize, but I did not understand what the consent agenda means, and I don't and I don't I know that Hope and Emma aren't written on the agenda, so I'm wondering if you could just say what the agenda is moving forward, for and I think the public comment section is done. So. Yes. Yeah. Oops. Uh, so we have Hope and Emma who give the student update, which is next, um, and then we've got very exciting board schedule. Do we have a comment around specific agenda items? Like, if, were you going to respond to Hope and Emma? Is that what you were thinking? I actually didn't know what they were doing on the agenda, but I just. Um, David, David, as, and I didn't, I think I even missed the moment where the consent agenda might have been approved. I saw things get pulled off of it, but not. Yeah. So uh, there's um, the policy that the board is adopting for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I will just maybe email my comments to the yeah, board at some later date, right. like this evening. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, we <laughs> got adopted. Sorry. Well, did did I miss the moment? I totally yes. missed them. I totally I was waiting for that. I heard We're not talking to you, so it doesn't count. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> so just for future, for future. Um, Thank you. So, so we have the public comment period where you can comment on, on anything that's on the agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, the consent agenda are things that we have discussed and are things that need, don't need discussion that we're ready to approve without discussion. So, right. so the reason that we didn't discuss the diversity, equity, inclusion is because we've actually been discussing that really over the course of most of this year. So we got to a point where that was, we, we arrived at language, and yeah, we've heard from many voices over that mm -hmm. that course, um, and so we're just at a point where like the board discussion was was done, so we could we could approve it without discussion unless another question arises, which would have done is that's when we pull items off. Um, maybe maybe the other thing we missed was we did uh, certainly sort of narrow in on this group, did you want to say anything for public comment? And there was a set of people over oh, here. Oh, I did say. If I, I, you did say I that? Did say Good. That, yeah. Okay, because at the beginning, there was a chance for anybody to come. About any? Yeah. No, I did say that okay, I good. was their point of the DEI policy and asked if they would want to say that. So might have been a misunderstanding. But it passed. It's a it's Yeah, a I just didn't, I missed that. I was like, are we so still, still waiting? Right. That's so when, it, when the consent agenda is approved, it's just everything there without yeah. discussing it. Yeah, didn't know that. So sorry okay. about that. But it's okay, I learned a lot of things about a school board meeting. <laughs> so, I'm not a sworn in, so I cannot make a motion. But if I were sworn in, I would make this motion. I would say that so you should just ignore it, right? But I would make the motion that we stop the consent agenda. Okay. 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 Okay.
providing the class privilege to people who are taking their kids out of school and excusing their absences and instead do that the way you might does it at the high school, which is unexcused, which is more consistent with what we're trying to achieve. And that we, and then that would also stop sending a negative message to the parents of Earth Watch who are getting unexcused when family vacations are getting excused to Disneyland. And I, that's the motion I would make that somehow we direct the administration to clean that up and make that more consistent to avoid the class pockets. Well, my question is that necessary because I don't have the procedure like in front of me, but my understanding is we don't have that provided for the procedure now, so we just... So Mike's violating it? We have up to five days. You okay. can plan that okay. up okay. to yeah, five for, days. Okay, yeah, thanks for... Can be, but doesn't have to be. No, no. Yes. it's one of the principles. Yeah. And isn't it in practice? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm going to confess, and I apologize for coming to this discussion late, but um, I'm going to confess that after eight years in the district, until this discussion was put on the agenda and I asked about it, I didn't really understand the difference between an excused and an unexcused absence. I thought unexcused was like my kid just didn't show up. <laughs> and was running around town and they would call. <laughs> Not that has happened, but you know, I was under the impression that, that if I called and said, he could be out of school today, that that made it excused for him. And that's how you're doing it. Because I feel like that. That's how the district does it. The experience. Yeah. It's not right, but it's how the district can do it. Right, so I'm, I'm not how so compared to the discussion. I think consistent. I, I, I said that, that is my understanding of how it worked, and it sounds like that isn't some policy. It's not a procedure. Or the procedure wasn't there. But it's the it's practice right now. Sometimes. Sometimes. Right, well, it's some no. schools <laughs> for some parents. So this is provided, this will provide you the opportunity to bring this up with my leadership team. Tell you all that you will get many questions. <laughs> um, so one question that I have is uh, just on the unexcused absence. So aside from okay, there's the potential truancy letter, and um, and we can see in Power School that our kid has X number of unexcused absences or whatever. Is there ever any kind of consequence for unexcused absences? I can tell you that when I was a principal of an elementary school in Chittenden County, yeah. Yeah, different, um, one of the truancy courts judges change every, all the time. It's like a rotating right. door. Um, I sat with a first grader who had missed 60 days of school. I sat on a hard court bench um, for five months. One, one time a day, or one time every five months, while I watched the judge say to a mom, get a better alarm clock. Oh, jeez. Um, so rarely does something happen, even if we go to court. Right. It, it's one of our absolute frustrations yeah. um, as educational leaders that we do the effort, we put the time in, we try to put make plans for kids, we try to we go above and beyond our effort for kids who are not succeeding in school with like multiple absences and truancy court does happen. But also they would, so if the kid was not succeeding and say they were not going to be promoted to the next grade because they were they were not meeting the proficiency to, mm -hmm. to move on, that wouldn't, they wouldn't be held back just for excused absences, they would be held back for not meeting right. the proficiency. Right. Right. Yeah. They're, they're like, really and we have a but if they had 60 unexcused absences, but were meeting for this they would still yes. we have some, we have a bigger conundrum there. <laughs> <laughs> we have a bigger conversation. Michelle, your point's perfect. They don't mean anything. Just check. Yeah. We have a conundrum there. Um, I can tell you that we have a very small, very small number of students that we were having trouble with around around getting to school, yeah. um, and they're suffering. For it, um, so, so and, and it's not just not not happening here, right? right now. And we won't get any help with that from anybody. Right. I mean, principals spend the majority of their time trying to get kids to come to school, right? In preference to sending well, them to court or yeah. Well, I mean, I <laughs> but but my, my, my question there. around attendance is more like, is it the attend? Does the attendance itself ever matter, or is it really the performance that always matters? I, I, have, I have yet to say, have you had the experience of a student who has missed significant days of school and, and
and for unexcused absences yet has been proficient? Have you had that experience? Uh, I, I mean, think I, I, that I understand I, the two things. I'm back in. I have, <laughs> done, well, I have had that experience, so I, I can. But uh, uh, our fundamental concern is yeah. always whether the kids are succeeding in school. Yeah. Right. More so yeah. than whether they're present in school. Yes. Right. Yes, and I agree that there's a, it's a small number of students, probably larger at the high school as kids get older, um, that just like, yeah, I'm not going. Um, and it's almost always, but we should not say always, uh, but it's frequently connected to many other yeah. issues. Right. Addiction, right. Uh, digital addiction is the thing that I'm most keyed in on. Uh, I think that I, I mean I will not belabor the point and but when I was a kid if I played hooky that meant that I was watching Days of Our Lives <laughs> uh, you know which I did not particularly care for you said that out loud. yeah <laughs> and if a student plays hooky now it's incredible what their options are um, for entertainment uh, and Unlimited and, and digital addiction, I believe, is very real, and we'll con we'll continue to see more effects of it. And so, oftentimes, again, this is like a little bit of a soapbox, but I'll zip it in a second. Oftentimes, we see this huge spike nationally and here uh, in depression and anxiety diagnosis. And I think that the digital addiction piece is really connected to that, and so. Oftentimes, students that have school refusal also have a diagnosis of depression or anxiety, and I think it's all sort of mixed in there with um, digital addiction and, and nerves about social interactions and pressure, and it's all mixed in, which is really what Lissa uh, Noss's role in fellowship was about. It's about like building a culture of wellness um, and risk taking and resilience. Um, so, anyways. That, I, that would be ditto. I know Amherst and Rannick's yeah. the same thing. Yeah, so I, I agree with you, Michelle, that it does sort of come down to the performance, um, especially, you know, as we struggle with truancy, not having many tools to utilize with that, um, except the stark reality of, well, now you didn't earn proficiency in this, so you're not moving on. And 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 my at the secondary level that gets very real. Um, so yeah, easy. Uh, Where are we? Uh, no student student update. Uh, so yes, yeah, thank you much. Fun plan. Again, I'm sorry that I cut and pasted you out. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to follow our usual format of um, some just updates of what's going on in the MRPS district and um, celebrations, and then we'll we can talk about our trip to Jackson, Mississippi, and what we learned about education. Is that excuse? Is that excuse? <laughs> <laughs> He's actually also thinking about that. Yeah. Um, I can't say that I am taking the folks to a conference on Monday and Tuesday next week. Is that what I'm also I will excuse her. <laughs> 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 here, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we'll student celebration that I'm going to um, introduce is also um, deals with some students being absent. It's for the New England Music Festival, um, and that's starting tomorrow, and so they're traveling down to Connecticut, and they're, I, it's, I think it's so cool that we have some students um, representing um, Montpelier and our district there because it's really exclusive and hard to get into, so that's exciting. Um, and the conference that I'm presenting with um, other students and Libby will also be there at um, is the New England Secondary School Consortium Consortium. Uh, don't know if I pronounced that right, but um, and the workshop that we're going to be doing is um, about how putting students at the center of learning sparked the Black Lives Matter flag raising, and um, 
it's similar to the workshop that we did at the Roland conference, and so we're just excited for not only the opportunity to connect with people from New York and New England, but also just to share our story with them. So it's, it's going to be exciting, and that's next week. And um, so students have also been working on and partnering with Liz and Noss and <coughs> people in the administration to work on <coughs> restorative practices. And <coughs> that is not just from a restorative justice standpoint, but it's also how we can sort of build community in our school and in our entire school community as well. And it's not just about what happens when harm is caused or someone does something wrong, but how we can um, use restorative circles just in, in our daily lives a bit more to connect students with each other and also connect students with their teachers. And it does tie into restorative justice as well, though, and, and how we um, treat our students and in making sure that whatever harm has been caused is resolved. And so we, students presented, I was one of them, and so did two other students, um, presented to a faculty meeting at the in-service that we had, I think, just last week. And so it, some students gave testimonies, but it was also sort of a more formal introduction to what restorative practices are and how we're going to go about implementing that at MHS specifically over the next few years. I'm gonna, um, so downtown, uh, the spring play at MHS sold out three nights in a row, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, and it was a very moving performance and well done. I can Adam, say, congratulations. Yeah, great. All <laughs> um, and uh, Interact Club uh, is, I think tomorrow, is going to be helping with a dinner at the Warm Shelter at St. Augustine's. Um, and they spent, today. yeah, they were cooking today. Um, <laughs> yeah, right after school, so, and I was, yeah, I was there, and it was pretty amazing to watch them in the small kitchen. All of them were like, <laughs> cutting all these things. Um, and uh, our classes and MHS Earth Group, and I think a few other student groups <clears throat> are partnering up and we're going to try and organize a clothing swap over the next month or two. I'm not sure when it's happening, but I know that it's in the works and it's coming up soon. Uh, uh, also, um, MSMS, I um, found out from a student there today that they're celebrating National History Day uh, by um, creating personalized projects. And uh, she's a fifth grader. <laughs> uh, and she's really, really excited about it, and it seems like all of her friends are really excited about it. Uh, she's doing hers on the Vietnam War, and I think it's just like a very cool way to explore whatever learning they want to explore. So. Yeah, that's, that's it for the first section of the student celebration. So we're going to talk a little bit about our time in Jackson, and um, just gonna, we're going to talk a little bit, but it's also just you can think of questions you might have for us, um, and it's more of a conversation, too, even though we are presenting on it. Um, so I was able to go um, last year, and I, for my second year, I wanted to, I had the opportunity to invite some students from MHS, and so I invited Emma and also Marianne Songhurst from the Racial Justice Alliance, and she's vice president, and she's done a lot of tremendous work in um, racial justice advocacy at both at the school level but also in um, helping push for ethnic study standards which just passed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the conference itself is a nationwide um, a group of teachers and progressive educators and um, some students nationwide and they all go down to specific locations each year and it's usually um, every two years they'll switch location and so we the um, group originally formed in sort of um, trying to it trying to 
deal with standardized testing and trying to make it something that was productive for students versus something that they struggled with or just impeded upon their development. And then it slowly progressed over the years. And so this year it was really focused on um, the state takeover of Jackson Public Schools and how um, the politicization of how of like just public school communities also relates to um, the power dynamics, especially with largely white state leadership versus a very, like I think Jackson is maybe the third or second blackest city in the nation. Um, and so the conflict there and also in um, just how we can support public education and specifically in Jackson, there's a funding issue and a lot of Jackson public schools are underfunded and then that's the excuse like like horribly underfunded, horribly underfunded. and I think Emma can talk about that a little more if she wants to but like like horribly horribly underfunded and then um and there hasn't been much progress made on that in recent years and then charter schools would open um as a replacement for like failing schools and a lot of times like the charter school um, movement and how that originated there was also after integration when um, and I don't know if it was specifically charter schools but I know it was just education outside of public education and um, a lot of times white families didn't want their students going to school with black students and so they pulled them out of schools and put them in um, I don't know like how they were able to get around it but I know that the private education was largely, I think it was vouchers or some of some sort, but I know that it was a way for um, white families who didn't want their students going to school with black people um, to um, navigate that. Um, and yeah, it, it was about sort of what's going on in Jackson, but also just a place to brainstorm how we can support public education and make sure students are just being supported and how that deals with learning, but also how it deals with discipline and funding. Uh, just to pull in some language that we use <clears throat> here a lot, uh, I think the two words that I uh, associate with that conference are equity and inclusion. Um, and specifically, the conference focused on giving equal opportunity to students um, in who navigate a system that is currently a national system that is currently set up to favor students who have privilege. And, um, and I think that one of the ways that we do that as a district um, is by providing resources to students that they might not be getting at home. Um, and that can be like computers or books. Those are the first things that come to my mind as like a high school student. But that's also a warm place and food mm -hmm. and um, support from teachers and um, inclusion is like a huge one, but also safety. Um, and I think that there are always places that we could improve on all of those resources and making those resources accessible to students and teachers mm -hmm. to provide them. Um, and yeah, that was what I really took away from that conference. Open to questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Questions. What did you think of the conditions of the schools in Jackson compared to them here? We didn't actually. We didn't end up. I think that one of the workshops that filled up quickly was to a high school, but we didn't actually end up going and seeing high schools in person. We were able to talk with some students and. Um, saw presentations from educators, but I don't remember what the data, what the actual numbers were, but do you remember? <laughs> For the funding? For like, yeah. Yep. Um, okay, the district, um, the Jackson District, school district, is under, um, under a million, no, it's no, no. It's half a million. It's half a million dollars for the entire school district. But like 50 schools? <laughs> it's like, it's no, no, this is serious. No, no. no. Like it's being serious. Like just, yeah. And they only Crazy. recently, like maybe a year ago, got like a bond approved that isn't even enough to like, it's a, it's, it, it's a huge, it's a huge It's the most, it's just thousand a year per student. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, this is a huge decision. 
disparity in education mm -hmm. priorities. Well, it's very intentional to create. Oh, it is very yeah, intentional. It's, it's and the whole fight flight thing, some of us are old enough, unfortunately, actually, remember when all this was happening, is um, sort of not just. Yeah, yeah you, create a, you create a you private You create a whole separate system. Yeah. A private system for one student, 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 and then you, you know, to get away from having to desegregate and have a spot with you. Public schools. Textbooks 20 years old. Yeah. You public schools and creating. I mean, I worked in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in the year 2000, and they were under a 25 year desegregation order. Still. Still. When I was working there. And non compliance. And mm -hmm. if you were, if you had any kind of money whatsoever, you did not go to public schools. Right? Mm -hmm. You just didn't do it. And the taxpayers have no regard for the money. Actually mentored by Bob Moses, I don't know, or Robert Paris Moses. <laughs> His house is like, like, literally around the corner from Edgar Evers's house. So like he's Jackson born and bred. Yeah, and he, huge civil rights leader. But um, point being, it, it's really they make sure that the town that they're staying in is very involved in the conference. Um, and just recently, I think Hope could probably speak to this more, but they're trying to involve students. Um, and so uh, Albert Sykes did, did pull in some students from Jackson schools. Um, mm -hmm. And also there were um, panels where we could hear from educators who work in the Jackson public school system. Um, and that was interesting. I think it was also about learning about the really rich history of Jackson, Mississippi. And I think it was important for us as Northerners to go down there and like just learn about the South from a new lens and it was it was I mean like we went to some museums and it was and just being there we also on um, the conference operated on the, the Tuvalu College campus and that's a historically black college and um, that was formerly formerly a plantation and so it was just also about learning about the history of like and the huge hub of the civil rights movement that operated there. It's interesting how these conversations between the, our, you know, the being in school and public education, they kind of dovetail with what you guys experience too. And the, you know, education is a, is a civil rights movement. Public education is a civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. um, and the importance of really everyone in, you know, everyone in one school in a sense. We're very lucky to have schools that have been for the schools. It's not luck, Jim. It's hard work. <laughs> we're working at it, Jim. We're uh, working it's at it. It's luck that we were handed the social and political structure we were. Um, but it gets bigger than that, doesn't it, in terms of self segregation communities and it yeah. goes on and on and on. You know, the, uh, real estate markets. Um, did you, did they, did you have any, is there more? Anything else? I don't think so. That's enough. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, these, these are very, I'm very sorry. It was good. I thought, I thought it was good. Um, so moving on, I actually think we can do this more quickly. There's a lot of um, schedule, wonderful people who are behind the ball by me. And also, uh, we have a half hour for a second. Is that the most? I just read that actually. Ryan, we put that on there because we thought that we would have had another negotiation session, but we ended up not doing that. Do you think that there's a need for that? Yeah, we could very briefly share what 
as we're inspired in the last week. Yeah, it won't be a long. Not, I think it's concrete necessarily, but we can let you know where we are. It won't take long. Yeah, let's say, let's say five minutes for a panel, Jay. Um, uh, yeah, unfortunately. Uh, so in terms of, of board planning, uh, yeah, I, this is kind of really the time of year where we want to get to some kind of bigger issues about where we want to go. Uh, there's a couple on the agenda. I think we've talked about some others. Uh, uh, you know, facilities, uh, obviously, because you want your communities um, as well as you know, advancing equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, we've also talked about uh, healthcare as something we want to discuss, um, RBS and facilities. I think those are kind of like the main topics. Um, and I, I think they kind of fall into two buckets. There's, I think, some more training around communications and equity in, in general, um, and then kind of some directional discussion around where we want to go on issues like equity, but also uh, health and uh, kind of looking at our facilities and uh, you know, the direction that, that we go, go there. Um, so... Would we also have a discussion sometime about how the school year went and any... Um, a look back. A look back and uh, what's happening next and what would next year look like? And what well, we definitely to want to have the what would next year look like. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I think that would, would involve some look back, but we can, we can put a little more formally uh, in that, right? Um, yeah. does, does health as a topic encompass substance abuse? Which is something that we haven't talked about. I was thinking substance abuse and... That's good, I just wanted to make sure yeah. that was in there. Yeah. Well, and I mean, we might want to get some of the issues that Mike was working on too. I mean, increases digital, digital. digital yeah, addiction uh, and you know mental health issues. You know, it's, yeah, depression, anxiety. Um, you know, the numbers are are pretty scary. As we more about in our district, and things we can use in the district to get it because those are uh, those are pretty problems. And so yeah, they, both our health curriculum and our district. It's educating the board about district concerns around student health. Exactly. And, and yeah, and those tie to equity issues too, because a lot of the groups that are are suffering the worst mm -hmm. from things like anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, et cetera, have to be groups that marginalized. When this was first brought up a month ago or whatever, I thought that part of the emphasis was going to be on the gender equality piece yep. of the health education curriculum, mm -hmm. the sex education, that kind of thing, and making sure that that's um, approached from a more feminist perspective, yep. you know, or at least it's guided by that. And I don't think that's I don't think that's in conflict with what you're saying, but as we look at equity and health, they go together. Yeah, it is. Yes. So what I was just going to say, so you're setting aside 45 days. <laughs> <laughs> is that professional learning around that, or is that the board guiding curriculum choices? Mm -hmm. That's my, that would be my question. I uh, think we would want the former before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think a little of the, the former. Um, I, I, think we, I think we have to approach it as a question that we're not going to bite off in one half day. but. Uh, it's, I'm increasingly hearing it from the community uh, from a variety of angles and I think, you know, some education and then, you know, something that we want to kind of continue to have a subject that, that we talk about and, you know, examine our policies around it, um, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yeah, maybe Libby, you could, I mean, this is putting a lot on you, but kind of guide us into what's a, what's a chunk that makes sense to go first on and then you know, and like it, it to solve those problems is more than a one year strategy anyway. It's, so yeah, it's really uh, being reasonable. I mean, students asked us probably two years ago to um, improve the health curriculum. Yeah, like now. 
and every and I don't know that we have. And every month since. When you say us, do you mean the board or the yes, school? The board. The board. Which consequently meant the school. <laughs> <laughs> We need to talk about what maybe you can tell, maybe you can give us some background on where you see mm. that we are. I don't think probably as board members we even all know, except through our kids' experience, at what point kids receive health education, what that consists of, and whether you or Mike see that as r remotely adequate. I don't think anybody does. Um, and how, you know, what plans you might have already for doing something about it. What are our options for doing something about it? And we have limited time. So. I'd throw Pam in that discussion, too. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. That's where it should be know, done. So I had the candidates for the high school principalship do a writing task, mm -hmm. and this exact topic was the writing task. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> it was a what would be your plan. Well, hmm. help. Mm -hmm. Good. So let's, let's maybe start with education there, because I think we could figure out what's what's happening, and, and some numbers too. What are, um, what do we know about, um, yeah. It's some education know about, about what we but, are doing. Yeah, but the behavior of our students, the, um, you know, addiction issues, mental health issues, um, Oh, I think there's new IRBS data. They just yeah. took it, so I'm not sure if it's out yet or not. Yeah, There's, so actually I've the students at the middle school did a presentation did, yeah. on was the... Was it this year's data, though, or last year? No, it was last, last year's, year's data. data. Last year's data. It's sometimes takes them... Last time it took them like two and a half years to get the data out. Yeah, I was going to say, because you, did you all just take it like a week ago? Mm -hmm. I have, yeah. I'm taking it tomorrow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's not... No, but, but some... The previous round... Did yeah. just come out, yeah. and for anyone who hasn't attended the parent, the kids' presentation at the middle school, they do a great job. They do. Yeah. So, so there's the scope question, then there's the plan question. What's realistic in terms of time? My preference would actually be to get a lot of this done before the end of June, because I think it's hard to coordinate around um, summer, uh, and maybe we could pick up like. You know, either last week of August or, or kind of first week of September, do another like more in dive. Um, I know it sounds like a lot, but I'm thinking maybe two extended sessions and a day. Yeah. So Jim, I don't have, I don't remember, and I probably should because we've talked about the budget process policy a lot. Yes. What is our timeline? Because the directives, a lot of this stuff does align with how we might impact the budget for next yeah. year. Yes. So whatever planning we do should do on these topics should be in alignment with that budget calendar. Yep. Um, That's why it needs to be done this year, so we're ready for. Is it yes. typically our first, re our, our full day meeting in June, I think is on the budget calendar as for discussing budget right priorities. I'm pulling it up right now. Are we going to squander our budget priority discussion talking about our children's health and welfare? No. <laughs> it just says summer. Yeah, it says, well, are you talking summer. about board, superintendent, and leadership discuss budget priorities? And Jim, are you talking about doing this at a board meeting, or are you talking about in addition to a board meeting? Uh, I, I was thinking of having two like extended board meetings that we might shift like earlier into the the day. Okay. And then doing a retreat that would be separate from a board meeting. And so you're suggesting that we do that in? Between now and June. Okay. Should we do a doodle poll to see? Does that sound too ambitious to folks? And then we can send around a doodle poll to see which dates work best. I think it would probably be challenging if you're trying to include principals to have anything happen in June. Well, we could get he wants it done by the June 1st board meeting. Yeah. Did he say by June 1st? Extended meeting is through June. Because you start early when the staff's still around, and then, right. you, then they, they leave. They have to stay for the Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, people I was just thinking, I can, I can, I can pull principles for when we need 
if we have the agenda set, we can pull principles from when we need them and then yeah, let so that go. go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They'll be fine with that. She says. <laughs> yeah, they don't love that. So why don't we sit around some doodle polls and see which which dates work best? Um, on the subject of scheduling, are we going to try to have two meetings in April, or are we just going to skip? We never have a meeting, I think, in it advance on break. the agenda during the spring break, which is almost always a board meeting. Now we so have we have scheduled, at least I have down, April 3rd and April 10th. I think we did schedule yeah. We did do that. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Oh. April 10th? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first two weeks in April on Wednesday, we have a board meeting. I can't come on April 10th. It's going to be an unexcused right. absence, Michelle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Why aren't you going to be here? Maybe it would be excused. <laughs> I think the radio's done. It's in Roxbury. Yeah, I may not be here. Oh, yeah, I think I will. The one on the 10th so, isn't right. So we better not extend the one on the 10th <laughs> if it's um, yeah. if it's absent. If it's already. A bit dicey. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. That's so. in Roxbury, which has limited space for us to extend it. Um, just the building itself has limited space. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> We'd be hanging out with them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get us yeah. We yeah. want some kitties. With us. And I will be coming from the uh, department. So maybe, for example, May 1st is a good one to extend. Yeah. We can do it on Doodle. That's it. Yes. But that's, we, we don't have a... You don't have a ton to choose from. <laughs> to choose from. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so we need a motion on... We need two motions on executive session. One that it will be in our detrimental to the board if we discuss in public, and then the second actually go into it. So do have the, the first one? And we have yet to post the language on the Bridget is really good at this. Okay. I move that the board find that discussing contract negotiations in open session would put the board at a disadvantage. A second. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, I move that we enter executive session. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. I have to